right. They were very fortunate to have the Midwest Street Park Collections Director of Vehicle Operations and Curator, Doug Malone, here to talk on a very interesting subject of quirky or ingenious automotive inventions and innovations. There are a lot of things out there that even us car folk don't know ever existed, and I think Doug's going to shed some light on a number of these for us today, and we can see how crazy we have we are as to what we try to do to our vehicles. So with that, done. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I was really looking forward to doing this presentation because these are items that I've just really found interesting in my years of loving cars. And, and when I was putting this presentation together, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what's out there. But these were some of the more fun ones that I came across when we were doing the research. So hope you'll enjoy these, these two as we talk about them. Um, and we're talking about all different generations. We're not just talking about the, the 70s or the 50s or anything. This is going to be the whole gamut from some of the very first automobiles all the way up to modern cars. So um, this is the first one we're going to start with here. This is Uriah Smith's 1899 Horsey Horseless. Now, you probably have not seen this. This was actually a prototype. I don't know that it ever went into production for making very many of them, if any. But his idea was to make the car look as much like a horse and carriage as possible to keep the other horses, which are more common on the roads, from being startled. It didn't work. They were still startled because of the noise of the engine. But it was pretty clever. The, the, hood act, or the, the head is actually made out of wood and was hollow so you could store gasoline in there. Now, I'm sitting there thinking about that. Something wood with gasoline in it in front of the passenger with, I don't know, it sounded like an explosion ready to happen, but, uh, but anyway, it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, it's interesting, the state laws back in those days were pretty much in favor of the horse and not the automobile. And so there were some pretty bizarre laws, and one of them, I don't remember which state it was, was if you were driving an automobile and it startled an oncoming horse, you had to pull your car off, disassemble the car until the horse buggy passed, and you put your car back together on the road and drive off. That's how bizarre some of those rules were back then. Or you had to have a gentleman precede you into town with a light and a bell ringing, announcing that you're going to be arriving into town with your automobile so people could watch their horses and their kids to get them off the road while you came into town. There were also rules you could use an automotive uh, conveyance for funerals. That was considered poor taste. So anyway, some really interesting rules back in the early days of automobile production. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about, I've got several slides here, is child safety seats. And these are really unique. You know, today we look at what these kiddos are put in, and they're, they're really snug and tight in there and overprotect. You know, we've got the, the neck and head braces. We've got all the, the harnesses. Uh, they have to be rear seating about a certain age and meet all these regulations. If they're ever involved in a wreck, you have to get, toss them away and get a new one. They're no longer considered safe. But uh, that wasn't always the case. And for all of us who grew up, in the, the 50s and 60s. We're lucky that we're all still actually alive today, but uh, I remember riding in the back uh, window well of the car on trips and things like that. So, But anyway, here's an early Gordon motor crib, which I thought was pretty ingenious. This actually fastened to the back seat, or the front back of the front seat. You see mom up here driving the car and the baby's back here uh, by his or herself in this, this uh, crib, and uh, it just, fastened onto the back of the seat with look, some kind of a support down here. But I can't imagine if mom stopped suddenly or got rid of that kid, it was still going to be in that, that little crib. And then there was even a smaller one called the bassinet. It was probably a few dollars less if you wanted to go that route. But uh, anyway, back in the days before there was much of anything, that was a way to at least uh, keep mom from having to worry about holding the baby while she's driving the car. Here's another one that was sold uh, it's called the uh, uh, Deluxe Baby Auto Seat, or Baby Seat, and I got a kick at $1.98. And if you really loved your child, you'd spend an extra buck and get the safety strap, beads and bells. Hopefully the beads don't come off so they can swallow them and choke on them. But uh, you see a little tiny strap in there, and it just hooks over the back of the front seat. Uh, nothing to attach it outside of that. And I can remember riding in something very similar to this. Mine had a steering wheel on it. Mine was ultra cool. Mine had a little plastic steering wheel on it. But I know it was very similar because I've seen million pictures in my parents' car with that. But uh, anyway, look at the prices of these. But, uh, you know, we laugh at some of this now. But, you know, it's really better than nothing. Well, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it was at least an attempt for a little bit safe, safer. 
Now this one, <coughs> when I first saw this, like I think it was Ralph Nader. You know, Ralph Nader is a gentleman that's responsible for so much of our safety uh, regulations in the 60s. He wrote the book on safe and a speed. So I'm going to guess this was probably Ralph Nader and his mom hung him out there. Uh, but I'm guessing they didn't drive down the road like that. And this picture actually is showing that you could use the car seat when the car is not being driven to place your kid in to keep them from running out in the street while you're talking to your friends or something. So no, it was not driven that way, hopefully, uh, down the road. But, uh, uh, but he'd have a blast, so if that was the case, he'd probably really enjoy that because I can imagine I would have at that age. But uh, anyway, uh, fun, fun little photo there. Now how about this one? This was for a Corvair. Who remembers the Corvair cars back in the early 60s? Pretty cool air-cooled rear engine car. Well, they came out with a dash baby, baby cradle that you'd put in the back window, and it was the engines back here on those cars. So they say, well, the vibration of the engine and the warmth, you know, would lull your baby to sleep. Also, uh, if you stop suddenly or get rid of the baby's going to be not there anymore. But uh, and I kind of wonder if the sun's really uh, beating down. The baby's going to be a suntan to burn probably by the time they get to their destination. But um, anyway, I got a kick out of the Corvair Dash baby cradle. And here we get into the 70s with the hammock. Uh, now that looks pretty comfortable, actually. You know, I sort of think I could go to sleep in that. Pretty, pretty comfortable. But, um, uh, you know, I'm kind of, you know, at least if you stop suddenly, it's just going to swing, I guess. Maybe knock mom in the back of the head. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know. All of us remember sleeping in the back window like on that Corvair uh, picture a minute ago. But uh, anyway, I don't think I ever saw a kid in one of these, but it looked pretty comfortable. Now, now this one, 1961, that's the year I was born. So, you know, I can, I can relate to this and uh, I hope my parents never used one of these. But for $1.88, you can strap your kid in. And I like the, where it says, you know, uh, somewhere on here, uh, removes these, you can use it a walking harness. Uh, but let them sit, stand, kneel, or sleep without disturbing the driver. Uh, but uh, anyway, it doesn't look real safe to me, but I guess it's safer than if they open the door and try to jump out. But uh, anyway, $1.88 for a Sears Child Auto Strap. And of course, we don't want to forget our pets. You know, pets ride in cars, and if you're like me and you don't like to have fur and mud and gunk in your car, this is why you can prevent it. You know, you just have your 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 canine friend right outside in a dog bag. And uh, now this, look, it's clamped down here under the running board. I hope the paws underneath there. <laughs> but uh, I don't know how thrilled the dog is riding there. Maybe, maybe thought it was pretty cool. But uh, it looks to me like by the time you got the dog in there and everything hatched down, that it's more work than just letting them in the car. But uh, I guess it did keep your car cleaner. But uh, anyway, pretty, pretty fun. This is from the 1930s. Car sack, canvas sack. Now what about these tops? You know, who has heard of the mod top? A few of you. I had never heard of the mod top until just a few months ago. Someone mentioned it brought it to my attention. So I thought I have to include the mod top uh, just because this kind of is a snapshot of late 60s, early 70s. When we look at those, those floral designs, uh, Chrysler Dodge Plymouth had this option on their cars. It was to try to make the cars more attractive to the younger, hip crowd of the time, a lot of times more towards the ladies. Uh, but uh, you look at the interior seat upholstery matches the roof on this car, and it was available as an option on a number of Chrysler Plymouth products from 69 to 1970. Did they sell very well? Don't think so. I never saw one, and I grew up in that time era. But uh, now I did have my neighborhood friends. Dad had a Plymouth Gold Duster. I think it was a 1971-72 that had a snakeskin roof on. I remember that that gold car with that snakeskin top on. That was pretty cool. Uh, I remember that top. So, but I never did see a mod top. Now, I brought this picture in here just because it just is a snapshot of 70s. You know, isn't it? Look at that wild paisley. Uh, type brocade interior on a Cadillac. This is very common on cars back then, uh, back especially in the 60s and 70s, to have these pretty extravagant interiors. Of course, the avocado green just screams uh, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, this is in a Cadillac, and you had this kind of taste in a Cadillac back at the time. But I can remember there was a banker up in Randolph, Kansas when I was a kid, not a kid, but a young man back in the 80s that would show up to my previous place of employment for funerals and he'd have this beautiful orange Eldorado Cadillac 
with a white and orange plaid interior. And I just thought that was the most awesome car. And I'm sitting there thinking, what was I thinking? But, you know, they're pretty collectible now. You don't see them out there very often. But uh, anyway, just a bizarre uh, inter interior for that period of time. Now, this one I found fun. This is a 1942 DeSoto cigarette dispenser. I had never knew that they had something like this, but the center of the steering wheel dispenses cigarettes. You could hold up to 14 cigarettes in here. And then if you pull this little knob, there's a little spring-loaded thing. It would pop a cigarette out the top, and you could just take it out and, and uh, light it up. All their advertising catered this to the ladies. I guess they said the men had pockets so they could have their cigarettes up in their pocket. They'd need to have this. So most all the advertising was talking about the lady driver could smoke a cigarette. Um, but uh, uh, pretty ingenious, but it was only for 1942. Of course, the war broke out, and all automotive production stopped for the war. And after the war, they didn't carry this on. So I'm guessing it didn't sell very well, but it was available on DeSoto in 1942. Love to find a car with one of those in it to really check it out. Uh, but I don't think they made very many of them. I'm sure uh, they're very hard to find, but uh, pretty ingenious really when you think about it. Because lots of ashtrays and cars back then and lighters, so you might as well have something to dispense as the cigarettes. Exterior sun visors. I've always thought these were rather interesting. Uh, you see these, especially on trucks, you'd see a lot of them on trucks, but they were on cars too in the 40s and 50s especially. Uh, before you had interior sun visors, back clear back in the 20s even, you had the exterior visors. Um, but I imagine it did keep the car much cooler. Um, but uh, this was an option for a number of years on cars. Uh, Add-on feature typically. Um, something that you notice in the next picture is going to kind of show you, if you cover up the top part of the windshield and see the, the can to the windshield there is pretty, pretty uh, straight up and down. So you pull up to the stoplight, it's going to be hard to see the stoplight. So they came up with something called the traffic light viewer. And there's a car out here, the 56 Chevy outside. Here has this one of these on the dashboard. So if you pull up the stoplight, this prism here would reflect the stoplight. And you could tell when the light changed colors without having to bend down and try to look up to see, see when the light changed. So that's called a traffic light viewer. These were sold through dealerships or oh, aftermarket companies like J.C. Whitney or something. These weren't a factory installed option, but you could buy them a lot of times through dealerships. You'll see them if you go to car shows, you'll see them on cars from the 40s and 50s uh, pretty frequently. Now we talk about navigation system. Look at the cars that we have today and how uh, technical and how they really just tell you where to go, when to turn, how many feet and all this stuff. And if you make a wrong turn, they'll actually correct you. And it's so easy to navigate to our locations today. But that wasn't always the case. And how many of us remember the great old maps? <coughs> And uh, typically, though, it's covering up the eyes of the driver while he's trying to read it, too. But, uh, and then trying to get the darn things refolded again never happened, right? But um, then generally you figure out about halfway through it that uh, uh, trying to find a road that you've got actually the wrong state's map and you have to pull the other map out of the glove box uh, to find out, figure out where you are. But uh, anyway, that's always been a problem. And it goes back to even trying to be solved as early as 1909. Uh, with the Baldwin Auto Guide, and this was a little device that strapped onto the steering column of the car, and you'd actually buy a little roll of paper that would go in there that had the map route on it, and you would physically turn the dial as you got down the road to advance it. There was actually a little battery in there with a little light bulb, so it would light it up, so if you're driving at night, you could still see it. Of course, the only problem with that is after X number of miles, you'd have to pull over, change the paper out, hopefully you have a roll of the current future map. It's a lot of maps to try to find, I think, for a role, especially since the maps back then were pretty much non-existent. They were pretty much <coughs> blue books or something like that that would tell you, you know, turn at the, the Fisher's Red Barn and go a mile down till you see the oak tree and turn left or something like that. I mean, it was pretty, pretty, um, n not very technical back then, but uh, pretty ingenious little device there. I don't know how well how accurate it was, but at least they were given a good try. Then we look at this Italian Eider Avto automatic navigator. Kind of the same principle in that you had a little roll of paper that you load in the bottom and another spool up on top. But the cool thing about this one is there's, you can see the kind of little cable here it goes down, hooks up to your speedometer. So depending on how fast you drove, it could speed up or slow down, this would advance with the speed of the car. 
so you didn't have to keep rolling it like you did on the last one. But uh, obviously, if you turned off the road, it no longer is going to work. But it's, or this is still working, but it's not going where you want it to go. So then you have to try to figure out where you where you left off when you get back on the road. But um, anyway, early navigation for some cars that we don't think that there was those were around back then. Fuzzy dice. I had to throw this in because how many people see fuzzy dice all the time in 50s, 60s cars? You know, typically 50s. And um, they're just real popular. And I just thought, well, that's just a 50s kitsch thing. But I never really knew the history behind them. You know, where did, why did these become so popular? And, and it's believed that they are a remnant of World War II. Uh, people uh, who flew fighter planes would have dice. And they would have lucky dice on the, on hanging from the dashboard of the plane. And typically with the, the pips coming out with the number seven for good luck, for a, for a lucky mission. And so after the war, dice meant good luck. And uh, so they started hanging them in their cars. So uh, that's why you see so many in the 50s, uh, late 40s and 50s, with dice hanging from the mirrors of their cars. I just thought they were cool. I never knew the story behind them. This is interesting. Neothane illuminated tires. These were, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They weren't a clear rubber, but they were transparent. Uh, uh, kind of a, uh, opaque, I guess you would say. Uh, Goodyear came out with these. They started developing them in the 1950s, and I thought this was pretty cool. Uh, the tires would light up, and you'd get different colors. They came in green and red and yellow and all the colors, and, and uh, uh, people liked them. The problem was that People liked them a little bit too much, so it caused some accidents because people were looking at the tires and not paying attention that the light was red and run the red light and have accidents. But also their downside to them was that uh, they were slippery on, on wet pavement, nice, they didn't have good traction. And due to the, to the neothane, which was a durable, but it melted if you brake too hard. So you could melt the neothane and, and have a flat tire. But uh, I guess there's a series of about 18 little flashlight type light bulbs inside the tires. I don't know how they were powered up, if there was batteries like off the car battery or how, but, but anyway, they lit up and pretty cool looking at night. Look a little bit out of place, I think, on the 64 Chrysler. Looks really cool on this car. But um, I'm anxious. Some, hopefully someday I'll get to see an actual car with these lit up to see how they looked, if there's some still around. But never, never was successful because of those safety, safety issues. Vent windows. Who remembers the vent windows in the cars? You know, I think all cars should still have these. I just love them. Uh, of course, these were designed for cars because they didn't have air conditioning back in the day. And so you could pop this open, you could crank it all the way out to cause air to flow into the car a little bit better for air circulation. Uh, some cars, this is on a 1960 Rambler, put them in the back so you could open those up. Um, I remember my mom, she smoked. Of course, everybody smoked back in the 60s but she'd pop that up to hopefully get the smoke to go out. It didn't, it made it come right back into me. Here's Jilly in the back seat or over here, so I don't think that worked too well. But uh, anyway, pretty ingenious. I think the last one of these faded out, I think I read like 1997 on the Ford F-150 or something like that. Yeah. The 1949 Hudson, it had vent windows in the back and the front. Back and the front, yeah, yeah. And uh, so pretty, pretty cool. Um, I had a Lincoln, my wife can probably remember this back in the, late 80s that had the vent windows that were electric and when you push the button the vent window would go down first and then the, the regular window and then it just would reverse that coming up and i got to thinking about that and i thought you know that's a little bit dangerous really if you had a pet in the car and the pet stuck its head out that little vent thing and hit the button with its paw you could have it like a guill guillotine pretty quick because it came up at an angle like a like a guillotine so but hopefully that never happened of course Sometimes you just think about horrible things like that when you try to figure out what's not safe about this. But um, anyway, pretty cool little invention uh, that cars don't have anymore that was very, very popular for many, many decades. Now this is one of my favorites. I'm a Cadillac guy, you guys know that, but I love the 58 Cadillac Eldorado Brome, and not because it came with a mini bar, but that is a plus. But uh, you open up the glove box, there were six, there's four shown here, I guess there's a couple there. Six stainless steel magnetic, uh, shot glasses. This little pad down here was magnetic so they would stay on there so you could mix yourself a drink while you're driving. Uh, and of course we didn't want to leave anybody out so uh, for the lady there's a bottle of Apergé perfume. 
uh, lipstick, cosmetic kit, mirror, uh, notepad, pen, uh, Kleenexes, comb, all kinds of little trinkets, and the glove box of the Cadillac Eldorado Brome. Um, pretty popular little feature on this car. Uh, very rare today you'll find these cars, but something's missing, typically has been lost or, or borrowed to somebody else. So just to replace these items, if you can find them today, you're looking at several thousand dollars to, to replace them if you can find them. They're that rare to find. So if you find an Eldorado Brome, all the parts are there. You're already at least two or $3,000 ahead of the game. So, but pretty cool, pretty cool feature. Kleenex dispensers, auto serve. This was an aftermarket dealer option. Uh, a lot of cars had them in back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, pretty nice to have an available Kleenex that's not taking up space on the seat. This just swings out from underneath the dash. You get your Kleenex and tuck it back away. Pretty cool little feature. Just something else the dealer can make some money on. Um, there's several cars out here that have that. If you look in, you'll see them. Deluxe steering wheel. This picture, I love a lot of things about this. I, Chrysler, to me, had some of the most beautiful dashboards and interiors in the late 50s and early 60s. I just love the, the space age the styling of the cars. But one of the big things that they did from 60 to 64 was use kind of this rectangular, squared off steering wheel. And um, uh, the purpose of it was to give more leg room for the, for the driver. This was about, uh, uh, tilt steering didn't come out until 1963. Uh, so, if there was, you know, they had the big wheels on a lot of cars back then because they didn't have power steering on a lot of cars. <clears throat> Most Chryslers did, especially this NISA one, but uh, so it was to give you more leg room. I, can, I had a 64 Chrysler New Yorker when my wife and I were first married, one of my first classic cars, and it had one of these type steering wheels. I tell you the strangest thing, when you turn the corner and let go of it to see that wheel kind of just like, you know, it doesn't, it's not a clean spin, it's kind of bizarre looking, but, um, it was, it was a comfortable car to drive. Um, of course, I love the sparkly steering wheel on this. It's clear with a little glitter in it and a really unique horn ring, the, like the little separate pod for the speedometer, had a little strip ribbon that would go across it. Just some beautiful styling in the cars back then. Uh, now, Chrysler wasn't the first place that had square steering wheels. There were a lot of companies prior to that that experimented with it, but Chrysler really pushed it from 1960 to 64, and then it just never, never went over real big. So. Uh, by the, after that, it, they pretty much well disappeared. Um, Ford swing away steering wheels. Uh, these are pretty cool. I think there's an interesting about 1960 on the Thunderbird. Maybe some of you Ford guys know. Is it 60, 61? Yeah. Thunderbirds? 60, 60, 60. 60 66. At least. I think that's exactly the right years, I'm thinking, yeah. But this, you could, uh, the, the whole steering column would swing off to the side. You can see it here. Uh, pretty ingenious, made getting in and out of the car much easier. Once you get in, you pull the steering wheel back straight, and once you start the car and put it in gear, it locks it so it doesn't move, so you can't swing it or pass it to your passenger while you're driving down the road. <laughs> Here you drive for a while. But, uh, but uh, anyway, pretty cool little, little invention. I think it was the, the vehicle safety regulations that changed about that time, about late 1960s. It, the C8s when you had that, the collapsible steering wheel. So yeah, that, that was the nail head for it. Yeah, so. That kind of was a death knell to the, to the swing away. But uh, yeah, because the whole column moved. Yeah, it's, it's pretty bizarre when the first time you see one. The first time I saw one when I was a kid, I thought it was broke because then it was clear over the side. I thought, man, that's really messed up. But uh, that's the way it was. And they just get in and pull the garage and it locks and, and off you go. This is interesting wrist twist steering. Uh, Mercury tried this, a Ford Motor Car Company on about four or five Mercury Park Lane cars in 1965. Um, unfortunately, they decided not to market it, but I guess it, it handled pretty well. They brought some, some uh, citizens in, like this lady here, to try it out. Uh, there are two five-inch little wheels. Um, there's arm rests you can rest your arms on. There is tilt steering, so you can adjust the height of where those little wheels go. But when you steer the car, you just turn those little wheels. And the, the thought was it would give you more of an unobstructed view out the front passenger window, and it was more comfortable because you didn't have to lift your arms up to turn. You could just spin those little, they both turn at the same time. Um, you can go online and watch little YouTube videos of, of this lady actually driving this car. Uh, and it handles pretty well and parks, you know, you're able to park the car pretty ingeniously. But I just think it's the coolest thing. That's just a perfect example of some of the types of ideas that we're experimenting with 
that um, were not that bad of an idea, just never took off for one reason or another. Um, but uh, anyway, wrist twist steering on 1965 Mercury Park Lane cars. Now Tesla has kind of gone back to a little bit of that yoke type steering. You'll see this on some of their new Tesla cars. And of course, it's uh, here again to allow better visibility of the large computer screen looking thing up in front of you. Uh, so you start to see here again, here's a modern car experimenting with different types of steering wheels uh, again. I've actually seen some of these around town here. thought it was pretty bizarre looking. Who's saying the Brody knob or the suicide knob on cars back in the 50s and 60s or the 40s? Um, little, little knob that you'd bolt onto the steering wheel. And this is, if your car, if it even had power steering, but not many did back then, it was to help you turn the car. You could just hold that. And a lot of tractors and trucks had them on them. But you could spin, spin it around by just holding that little knob. And then uh, if you let go of the wheel, you better hang on to the knob. Because if you're not, you could come around and break your wrist or, or at least do some serious bruising if it came around too fast and hits your hand. But uh, that's why they were called suicide knobs or knuckle buster knobs. But um, uh, I thought they'd been outlawed, but I, when I was doing the research, I guess they haven't been. Uh, but you can still have them on your vehicles. But um, I wasn't aware of that. I thought they'd been, been made illegal. Maybe some states they are, but uh, maybe, anybody know? Yeah, they're illegal in Illinois, have been for decades. In Illinois? Well, that's Illinois though, Chris. You know? <laughs> yeah. That surprised me, Illinois. I thought they were pretty. Hmm. No, 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 okay. Some states are illegal. <laughs> okay. But I remember my dad had a Rambler with one of these on there. I always thought it was so cool. He called it the green eye. I don't know why. But uh, anyway, Brody knobs. Swivel seats in cars. This is pretty cool. Uh, here again, Chrysler, Dodge was big into these types of innovations. I love this one where it can, turns completely around. It even came with a little table. You could attach to the floor so you could play cards or whatever with the rear passenger if you wanted to. Um, this one just swiveled to make it easier to get in and out of. A number of car companies did different, I know like Monte Carlo and some of them in the early 70s I remember had swivel type seats. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that they just didn't go over because of safety reasons. I don't think the front seat would be allowed anymore today to just turn around uh, because of the airbags and stuff like that that are required. But uh, pretty ingenious, pretty, pretty cool, pretty unique thing to try back in this period of time. Doug, you got a question. Does it go full 360 or just 180? You know, Caitlin, I don't know. I'm going to guess it doesn't go full 360 because of the console. I'm going to guess it probably swings back around out this way. So you probably turn it and sit down and swing your legs back around. But, uh, That's so. A Buick. Huh? That's a Buick. This is a Buick? Well, the Buick guy would know, so. So, that's, so, so Buick had it too, so that's cool. John said he likes those seats, but it's a little hard to drive. Yeah. <laughs> if you have that steering wheel that swings over, you can just put it over in front of you. And <laughs> Nash was big about having fully retractable seats, and they really marketed that and turning your, your car into a bed. Um, you have to stop and think, you know, back in the 30s and 40s and stuff when these were out, there weren't a lot of places to stay alongside the road, and a lot of people camped. Uh, so this would be a way that you could pull off to the side of the road and sleep inside your car instead of having to pitch a tent. Uh, of course, Rambler, Nash kept those for, I know through at least the late 50s, out of 59 Rambler that had those retractable seats. Uh, of course, it made all the fathers nervous when the gentleman showed up to the, date and his daughter that had a Nash because of the retractable seats. But uh, uh, pretty common, uh, beloved feature for the Nash and Rambler type cars, and maybe some other cars had fully retractable like that. I'm not aware of them that did as quite the extreme that Nash did, but uh, pretty ingenious little in innovation there. Highway Hi-Fi record player. <clears throat> these are so cool, but pretty much useless. And Chrysler came out with these on their products in 1955. Uh, there was a company that built these for them. They were a factory installed option to the cars typically on highly loaded cars. The thought was, you know, the cars had the radio, but you had to listen to whatever was on the radio. They didn't have the cassette tapes and those kinds of things yet. So this was a way to play what you wanted to in the car, at least what Chrysler thought you would want to hear, because they didn't take any kind of record. You had to get special records that were sold by Columbia Records 
I think they were, instead of 33 or 45, I think they were 16 RPM. They played much slower. You could listen to about hours of music on them. Um, they worked about as well as you would think. I mean, the little arm down here they had to have a lot of pressure on the on the, the record, so it wouldn't skip too much if you hit bumps, but it would still skip. Um, and there was so much trouble with them, and they were under warranty because they were a factory installed thing that Chrysler pretty much threw in the towel after a few years and quit quit marketing them. But they're highly valuable today. If you find a car with these in them, uh, they're highly valuable and very collectible. I would love to have one on a car in here in the museum just to be able to display it and show it. But it's called the Highway Hi-Fi. Now there was another one that came out about 1960 that was called Highway Hi-Fi too, but it was a different company. It would play traditional 45 records, but I heard it was kind of prone to the same type of thing because of the pressure of the, the needle on the record to keep it from vibrating. It chewed up the records pretty quick, so it just didn't last. Then you got to place, you know, where do you keep all the records? They're not going to fit in the glove box. Well, they might have in some of those cars back then, but uh, a lot of them didn't have center consoles and things, so there's always a storage issue. That was always a thing with the eight-track tapes. All these eight-track tapes, where do you put all these, you know? I had a big box in my back seat full of eight-track tapes. But um, blue, Bluetooth and those things today are great. <clears throat> Bendix Electric Hand Pre-Select. Now, if you've been on our display floor, our cord out there has this. This is pretty ingenious. Uh, this was developed by Bendix for Hudson Motor Car Company in 1935. You look at some of these old 30s cars and 20s cars, all of them had a gear shift on the floor in the middle. Well, it didn't take long for people to figure out if that gear shift wasn't right where the middle passenger needed to sit, it'd be a lot more comfortable. And so Hudson reached out to Bendix and said, hey, how do we get this gear shift off the floor? If you remember, there wasn't automatic transmission yet. There wasn't even three-speed manual transmission on the column yet. So Bendix developed this little pre-select deal it's not very big. This is like for a finger or thumb hold. And uh, it's like a four speed on the floor. Uh, and you shift it a little unique in that uh, uh, you put down here like into first, you use the clutch to get moving. Once the car is moving, you flip the little switch with your finger up to second. Then you want to shift to second, let off on the gas pedal, the vacuum change in the engine will shift it at the right time. If you want to shift to third, then you just flip it down to third. You're going to let off on the gas pedal, it'll shift into third. Uh, you want to go downshift again, throw it back up, and it'll look the same kind of a system. Uh, or you can use the clutch pedal too, and it will activate it too, but you don't have to always use the clutch pedal to get it to work. Um, but pretty ingenious little thing. Now, they were a little bit troublemat problematic because they there was a set of wires that ran through here to a solenoid, to a vacuum motor, to the transmission, so there were some things that could go wrong. And Hudson didn't want people to be stranded, so Hudson still attached a gear shift underneath the dashboard. And there was a plug in the floor, so if this failed, pull the plug out, pull the gear shift out, screw it in the floor, and bypass, bypass the system. Cord didn't want to worry about that, I guess, because Cord did not offer that option. So you just had to either, either it worked or it didn't, I guess, on the cord. But we've driven the cord out here a little bit, out in the parking lot area. It, it does, does pretty well. It's just a strange way to shift. Uh, 1939, they came out with a three-speed column gear shift. Here again, the floor gear shift off the floor. Got rid of this. So this is only about a four or five year deal. Now, if you look at a 1948 Tucker, it will be using the same kind of a shifter because Preston Tucker used these cord transmissions and pre-selects on his Tucker. Hearst lightning rod shifter. How many of you have seen these on cars? Got a few hands up here. This was... Uh, Developed by Hearst in the early 1980s. Of course, I guess the more the shifters, the cooler. Uh, people didn't really care for it. Um, it's a little bit unique in the way it shifts, and that uh, you can drive, put down here and drive, and either by pushing the right lever or the left le middle lever, forward or backwards, will change change gears for you for different types of performance. Uh, it was kind of a complicated little system to have to worry about. Uh, I think they're on um, old cutlasses from 1980 to 83, somewhere in that time frame. They tried it on some Firebirds and some other cars, Camaro, Chevrolets. It just didn't sell very well. But they're really cool. I will say they're really cool looking. I've seen a couple cars with them on it, the car shows and, and uh, auctions and things like that, but I've never driven one. And you can see it's got the whole shift pattern, how to shift to different things up there. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, pretty, pretty cool looking, something developed by Hearst back in the 80s. Push button transmission selectors in cars. I always thought these are really cool. My folks had Ramblers, a lot of them had push buttons in the early 60s. 
Uh, Chrysler and Dodge were big on push buttons. I think they introduced it in 1955 on their cars. <coughs> but you'd this, fill this lever down to put it in park. Edsel. Edsel, yep. Uh, fill this down to put it in park, uh, to start the car, then throw it off park and push whatever button you want to, to go for a direction. Uh, worked pretty good. Uh, my understanding is, because I looked up and thought, why did they quit doing that? Because, you know, that's pretty pretty simple operation. And I read somewhere that the government came out, when they came out with the, that all gear pattern had to be park, reverse, neutral, drive, gear pattern, uh, or government cars could not have anything different than that. And that, that Chrysler wanted to be able to sell cars to the government, so they got rid of the, the push buttons. That was 1966. I think these went through 1964 on Chrysler's, if I remember right. So that's probably, probably a true statement with standardization for safety reasons. But uh, pretty, pretty ingenious, pretty cool. Um, they're back, yeah. They've been back mm -hmm. recently on some Fords. So yeah. I had a 1960 Mercury that had that, and as a youngster, I was drag racing with my brother and sister in the front seat, and I went first, second, and then I missed drive and hit reverse. <laughs> uh, yeah. I can see why they dropped it. Wasn't it pretty? <laughs> my sister ended up with a big bump on her head <laughs> by hitting the windshield. <laughs> yes, yeah, some of them, I know Rambler, I think Mercury too, uh, one of the buttons you'd push also to start the car. You have a key, you turn the key, and you'd push push the button. I think it was neutral start button. But uh, yeah, pretty cool. So of course had them in the steering wheel. And we're going to talk about that here in a second, yeah. Uh, like this one, for example, 1914 electric push button shift control. <laughs> this is on a Winton 6 car. I didn't have any idea that anything like this back that early. This was a manual transmission car, but it had push buttons on the steering wheel. You'd push the clutch in, push the button, shift it. Push the clutch in, push second speed to shift it, or neutral, or whatever gear. I had no idea. I'm guessing it was pretty problematic, because I'd never hear anything about it, and it didn't, didn't go over. But I had no idea that they had something like that clear back in 1914. And of course, we've been talking about the Edsel, and the Teletouch push buttons in the center of the steering wheel. Edsels were very problematic because they were electric, they weren't a mechanical connection, and the wires ran right next to the exhaust manifold and the wires would heat up and it would short them out. Uh, so sometimes you get an Edsel and put it in gear and it wouldn't go. You push reverse and it'd go forward. I mean, there was all kinds of problems. Other problem with Edsel, even though it was really cool, is it's where the horn button usually was on those cars. So a lot of people, like you were talking about, Ron, except in this case, they go down the road, want to honk the horn, I forget, hit the middle of the steering wheel, push the wrong button, screw up the transmission in the car by pushing the wrong button. But uh, pretty, pretty cool uh, little system. We talked about, yep, they're back on cars. This is in our 2022 GMC, has push buttons. Again, you push your pull uh, to shift the gears. I hate this. I think, <laughs> I think my wife would probably agree. It's just weird, especially where it's located. I'd give me anything for a gear shift again, but uh, it's just, it's not in a good location and it's just strange. Yeah, you've got, yeah, yeah, you drive the car more than I do, but, but when I get in the truck, I'm like looking for the button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we're back, back to the push buttons again. So horn rings, uh, very popular. This was a safety thing. So you could keep your hands on the steering wheel, just reach over and push the ring to honk the horn. You don't see those on cars today. Rim blow horn. How many have heard of a rim blow horn on cars? Got some hands going up. I had a 71 Riviera that had rim blow. What that is, and you can barely see it on this, a little black line right in the center of the steering wheel here goes all around the circumference of it, but that's where the contacts are. So to honk the horn, you just squeeze the rim. That activates the horn. Um, sounds like a good idea. Did not work good. Uh, the plastic would get dried out after a couple of years and be brittle. Uh, the contacts wouldn't connect. Um, having one, it never wanted to honk when I wanted to honk. And not a good road rage thing either, because when you're really mad at somebody, you don't want to squeeze well, you want to hit something, you know. So, so uh, anyway. anyway, they didn't succeed because they were problematic. Uh, a lot of people took the steering wheel off and replaced it with a traditional steering wheel. Clever idea, this one's on an AMC AMX, uh, so different companies tried it. But uh, rim blow steering horns. 
Space Age dash design controls. I'm huge. I love artistic designs, and I think the 50s and 60s were some of the best. On the left, we have an Edsel, 58 Edsel. You have a Cyclops uh, type speedometer here that spins like a compass. This little knob here has numbers on it. You can dial that to a certain speed. When you reach that speed, this will light up orange to let you know you've reached your designated speed. Here again, you have the push buttons in the center of the steering wheel. You have knobs over here to turn to adjust for the heat and air conditioning. Uh, tachometers, you have toggle switches. Very, very modern for 1958. Look at this Dodge over here with the clear see-through speedometer. Little strip that would come through there to tell you what speed you're going. I had to look closely to see what this is. It's a clock. And that spins and it's got like the hour and the seconds and stuff. But that's the clock. Uh, you got your push buttons for your transmission and your heating and cooling controls. Awesome steering wheels. Here again, you've got that beautiful steering wheel with the, the clear translucent with the speckles in it. But just very beautiful dashboards back at that time. Everything was very space age and, and out there. Of course, very unsafe, I'm sure, if you're in an accident. All kinds of things there to get injured on. No airbag in the middle, obviously. But uh, uh, anyway, beautiful, beautiful designs on those dashboards. Nash came out with something in 1949 called the Uniscope. Ugliest thing I've ever seen. My grandfather was a big Nash guy and he had one of these cars with that Uniscope. I saw pictures of it. But it's just a big pod that sits on top of the steering column. It has a speedometer, it has the gas gauge, the generator lights, everything that you want. The view is right there, right in front of the driver. Radio still off to the side. But it was called the Uniscope. And that was something that Nash experimented with for 1949-50. Must not have gone over very well because that was the last years they used it, to my knowledge. But here again, something cutting edge, trying it out, see what people thought of it. These are in those big old Nash bathtub looking boats, which were already bizarre looking to start with. Then you get in to have this, so. They had lay down seats. They had lay down seats, yep, yep. That's exactly right. Hide and seat gas caps. We can thank Cadillac for this. In 1941, Cadillac hid the gas cap behind the left tail light lens. They didn't want the ugly gas cap in the side view of their beautifully new designed Cadillac. So they tucked it underneath the left tail light. People loved it. They loved having that hidden area feature. Cadillac continued to do that through the late 1950s in all their cars. A lot of other car companies also adopted This is a 56 uh, Chevrolet hidden by the tail light. Uh, here you can see some others. This is a 58 Oldsmobile where the top part of it flips up and the cap's hidden underneath there. I think this is a 58 Pontiac, and the reverse light swings out and the gas cap's hidden behind there. You see a lot of them hidden behind license plates back in those days and things like that. Pretty ingenious where they tuck some of these. Uh, today, if you pull up to a gas station, one of these cars, we don't have anybody to come out and put the gas in the car, so it's not going to do any good anyway, I guess. But if you did still have gas station attendants, young kids today, they wouldn't know, have the slightest idea where to find the gas cap on some of these cars because they're pretty, pretty hidden. But uh, it was all about style and design and uniqueness and innovation. And that was just a real clever thing to have back in those days. Of Those type of gimmicks were very, very popular. Conrad radios. How many of you have driven an old car and you see these little triangular shaped deals up on top? Well, we can thank President Truman for this. He came out with this in 1951. It was a civil defense type of a system. Uh, all radios from 1951 till, I don't know, early 60s, I think. Some of you guys probably will tell me. We're required to have these little arrows up there at station 640 and 1240. And that was in the event of a civil or a, a nuclear attack or something like that, uh, that uh, public address, you were supposed to tune to those two stations to get your information. All the other stations were to go off the air. Uh, so it was an early form of of uh, emergency alert system. Uh, it was later replaced by the systems that we have today. But if you get in any old cars prior to, I want to say probably prior to 1964, I know my 63 and 61 still have these, you will see those little, little triangular arrows up there. Even on household radios or anything radio, we have those little arrows up there. So now you know, know what those were. It's all about uh, emergency alert stations. Chrysler electroluminescent lighting. Who has, who has ever had this on their car? Anybody here? I'd love to know the, the engineering behind this. All cars back in this day had just the little white light bulbs 
and Chrysler came up with this electroluminescent lighting, which gives beautiful green cast. Uh, the, the, are the little uh, directional arms there would light up orange. Uh, it's a pretty complicated little system. I was trying to read up on it, and I needed to have a better degree than I've got to understand it, how it all worked. But it gave this beautiful, soft, uh, glowing cast out that uh, was uh, pretty cutting edge for the time. And Chrysler had that for oh, several years anyway on a lot of their cars. Just a beautiful new look to cars. I remember how excited my dad was when we bought a new Rambler in 1966. We hadn't driven at night yet. I remember going out. We were out at some friend's house late, and he got in the car, and we turned the lights on, and the dash lit up green. He was just ecstatic. He just thought that was the coolest thing. I still remember that. That's been 50-some years ago, how excited he got about that. It wasn't electroluminescent, I don't think, but it just lit up green. Prior to that, everything was always white. Just funny things that uh, you get entertained about, but, uh, but that was uh, one that Dad sure liked. Automatic headlight dimmers. You'll see this on a lot of cars back in the 50s. Cadillac introduced this in 1952 called the Autronic Eye. Large device that's up on the left side of the dashboard. This electric eye right here. Whole system underneath the dashboard uh, that runs this system. But it was if a car was coming when you had your bright lights on, it would dim them down automatically until the car passed, turn them back on. Uh, this is very early, so it worked about so-so. It would pick up, if it was raining out, sometimes it would pick up light reflections in the, the water and, and activate it falsely. Uh, there was no way to adjust the, the sensitivity on the early ones. In 1960, they adopted it, called, then called it the Guidematic. Had a little adjustable knob on the back so you could adjust the sensitivity to it, depending on the driving conditions. Made it a lot more friendly to use. I know Cadillac had this on their dashboard until 1963. Then it became hidden underneath the grill. But Cadillac kept this on their cars well into the 80s uh, and then hidden in the grill. But uh, now modern cars, again, have this uh, automatic headlight dimming thing. But for the 1950s, that was pretty cutting edge. And Cadillac was the only one that did it. Cadillac in introduced it, but it went on a lot of other cars. And a lot of General Motors cars, you could buy it as an option. Even on that 56 Chevy, you could buy it as an option. Um, Chrysler used it, uh, about any kind of car. Lincoln, Fords used it, their own style of them. But uh, if you see something sitting up on the dashboard, it's more than likely automatic headlight dimmer from the, from the 50s. Automatic seat belts. Anybody remember these? What a great thing. You know? The idea behind it was, in the, in the late 70s, President Carter said that all cars in the future are going to be required to either have automatic seat belts or airbags. Well, car companies didn't want the expense of the airbags. Those were still pretty, pretty new in, in development and very expensive. So they opted for the, for the automatic seat belts. And it was thought this would improve seat belt wear. In the late 1970s, seat belt, relab or seat belt use was about 20%, they said. So about 80% of people weren't wearing seat belts by the late 1970s. They wanted to increase that. So they came out with these automatic seat belts. They became very popular in the early 90s. I had a Mitsubishi Galant, maybe Lincoln can remember this, and it had one very much like this. You'd get in the car, shut the door, turn the car on, the electric motor would run this up across the roof to pull a lap belt across, across your way. You still had to fasten this, this, the bottom belt, which nobody did. You know, well, I've already buckled in. That came across, you felt secure but you weren't all the way buckled in. Turned out it was more dangerous, actually, because just having this without the seat belt injured more people if they were in an accident than if they hadn't had anything. So some other car companies tried attaching the whole three-point harness to the door. So you open the door, the whole seat belt would kind of come out. You get in the car, shut the door, and the seat belt would just wrap around you. People got tangled up in that, especially if you had purses or stuff you're trying to carry. This wasn't, wasn't a good thing. Um, by 1998, airbags became mandatory in cars, and so car companies by that time did away with these. But they were on cars, a number of cars in the early 90s, you see a lot of them. Uh, cool idea to try to get people to wear seat belts, just didn't work out. Swamp cooler air coolers. There's a 57 Pontiac on our display floor, a new, new addition to our floor that has one of these hanging out. Go out and check it out after we finish here. This was early air conditioning, guys. You know, we're back in before, before cars had air conditioning in them. How do you get a little bit cooler air in there? So these are called swamp coolers or air car coolers. And it's a large, looks like a vacuum cleaner. You know, those old cancer type vacuum cleaners hanging from the window of your car. But you'd actually fill the interior up with straw or with balsa, balsa wood shavings or something like that. 
put water in there, about a gallon of water. And as you drove down, there's a little, you can't see it, but on their side, it's open and it vents into the inside of the car uh, through the window. And so when you're driving down the road, air will come in through this way and will pass over that straw and those balsa wood shavings and the water would evaporate, cool it, come into the car for a little, little bit of cooler, cooler air. I haven't talked to anybody that's ever driven a car that had that. Maybe somebody here has. Was it, was it work, Ron? It did work. Did work? I heard it was very effective in the southwest. Yeah, especially if you're in a dry, dry, dry climate, yeah. But uh, um, anyway, it was a, a dealer installed option or you could buy it through uh, uh, aftermarket type places. They weren't a factory installed thing. It just hangs on there uh, rather loosely, I think, for, for, for safety. But uh, uh, you could also get uh, fan powered ones. So that would work if you were even stopped at a stoplight that the fan would keep blowing through there and help cool the air to bring it in. A pretty ingenious little thing. Of course, you'd have to stop after so many miles, add more water to the tank if it had all evaporated out. But I guess a little air, cooled air is better than nothing. And apparently, they were somewhat effective. So be sure to check that one out if there. It's kind of unique to look at. All different companies made them. Thermador and Firestone and Sears, all different types of places made them. Bulky thing. I'm sure the passengers got the cool air, but they didn't get any view. So I guess either you could be cool or get a view to take your pick. Ford retractable. Now, the cool thing about convertibles was uh, the convertible, the downside was having the soft top. People liked the look of the coupes with the, the, the solid tops, but they loved the convertibles. So uh, this was designed actually for the Continental car in 1956 for the 1957, 58 models. If Continental had survived, they were going to do this. Well, of course, Continental failed. Uh, and uh, so Ford used it for the 57 through 59 Ford Skyliners. Uh, but it's a convertible, fully retractable hardtop, and it works through uh, a series, I think it's seven different electric motors. I don't know how many fuses and contact points, but uh, you push a lever inside the car and the rear trunk opens up. Uh, the, the roof starts to come back, the front part of it folds down underneath, the whole thing slips down to here, the top lowers back down and closes over it. Looks like a, just a regular car when it's all done. The top's up, it's like a regular two-door coupe. Pretty cool, pretty ingenious the way it works, pretty, pretty marvelous engineering. Uh, only problem was it took up all your trunk space. There's a spot in the back that's got a little metal, they call it a basket. It's about three foot by three foot, that you can put something in there and it won't get damaged. Anything outside of that's gonna be taken up by the mechanism of this roof. You can get special luggage that would fit in that little kind of basket for, for these cars, but really, really cool, ingenious way uh, for convertibles to be. Uh, and some modern cars, I think now the newer cars, some of the newer convertibles will have something very similar to that, but for late 1950s, that was pretty, pretty cutting edge. Who knows what these little, little things are down here? Starter? Close? Bright lights. This happens to be on my 61 Cadillac, but this is the headlight dimmer over here. Anybody have any idea what this one is? No. Nope. No. Nope. Radio. Radio. Push that, and the radio will scan to the next station. Pretty cool. Huh? It's a little bit of a. Sometimes it's a little bit of a challenge, you know. And um, I've got a floor mat that goes in here, and this one's exposed. And this one's underneath the floor mat, the way the floor mat hits. But I know if I put my big size 13 feet up there, and it's going to change the radio station if I'm not careful. But uh, yeah, uh, that was a, you could get these installed at the factory or the dealer can install them too. But that was a pretty cool thing for the, for the uh, cars with the scan radios back in the time, AM scan radios from this car. But um, yeah, that's what those are. I wish they still had these. Oh, I thought that was pretty Pretty good spot for that. Now everything's on that stock. I mean, everything's on that stock. Uh, this was, you always knew where it was. But um, anyway, thing of the past. Now we were talking about the windshield washer a little bit ago. Here you go, that's what this is. Here's the headlight dimmer in this car. This little pedal up here, you'd push that and that would squirt the water on your windshield. And there's a little um, bat, or not, a, I don't know what you call it. A, inflatable thing that you'd pump that and it would squeeze the water up through the onto the windshield. 73 Ford Mercury Capri had those. Really that new of a car had them still. Yes. Wow. Wow. 
I know my folks as my folks as ramblers had those. I don't know through what year, but I remember one time, I can still remember clear as yesterday, going up Claflin Road over here sometime in the 60s. Mom went to pump that and it sprung a leak and water started squirting all over the floor. Like I remember her going, ah! But uh, yeah, but uh, why these things stick with you, I don't know. I mean, but uh, I thought it was pretty funny. But she didn't think it was very funny. Here's something unique on a 1984 Toyota, a van and ice maker in the van. The little refrigerated thing up here that make ice cubes. I'm sorry, but why do you need ice cubes? No, not very many of them. To go with your bar. To go with your, well, it doesn't have a bar, though. <laughs> now, the Cadillac needed this. The Cadillac Brome needed this, yeah. But uh, here again, it was just something to try out, and it didn't go over very well. So I think after about four years, they discontinued it. I don't know how well it worked. Here it looks like it's working pretty good. But um, anyway, ice cube maker. Rolls Royce umbrella holder. Little slot here when you open the door up. And there's one on the passenger side and the driver's side that you can fit your official Rolls Royce umbrella in, which I Googled, and the umbrellas alone are 700 bucks. But uh, you can slip it in there. Pretty cool. There are drainage holes in there and an air blower cooler or heater. So when you put the umbrella in there, it's going to dry it out for you. So next time you pull it out, it's dry and ready to go again. Pretty, pretty ingenious. So if you buy a $500,000 Rolls Royce, you get, get your umbrella taken care of. <laughs> Might not even know it's there. Huh? Might not even know it's there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, just another little gimmick thing. But uh, those are on brand new Rolls Royces that you can, can get that feature. Fifth wheel driving. This is kind of cool. I'm going to see if a little video will play. And if traffic was bad, the parking problem was impossible, just like now. So one California genius disproved the simile useless as a fifth wheel. His fifth wheel aimed sideways, and with it you could sneak into the tightest hole. Better than power steering? Well, somehow it never caught on. Why not? We'll never know. That's ancient history. With new cars getting bigger and parking spaces getting smaller, at Piedmont, California, an inventor has developed something to soothe the motorist's headache by putting the spare tire to work. He calls this device the park car and says it can be installed on any model. Watch how it works. Taking power from the drive shaft, the spare tire swings the rear end into the clear. Then he just retracts the spare, backs into the street, and away we go. It's handy for parking in inaccessible garages, too. Here's a narrow driveway, but with the spare tire put to work, the car can turn a complete circle in its own radius, and parking is simple indeed. Even the worst driver can make the garage without denting a fender with the aid of fifth wheel driving. This was a special edition on a car called the James Bond edition. It had an invisibility switch, seat injection, uh, missile launcher, and ludicrous speed. All right, it's April Fool's Day, so I had to throw in something to... No, this never happened. You can actually buy those little, little decals to put on blank buttons in your car. If your car doesn't have a, it has a blank out switch, you can buy those little fun little things to put on there just to see the reaction of your, of your car, yes. But I thought that was pretty funny. But, you know, we talked about all these things that have gone on over the past and all the wild things that you saw back in the past. But, you know, you look at cars today, they're no different. I mean, they're trying new things. You look just like at this Cadillac, Larique, uh, the dashboard on that, all the digitalization, the computers and... This is an electric vehicle, of course, but uh, um, trying new things. Whether it will be successful, time in the future will tell us. We won't know until, until some years get behind us, but it's just not, we know we laugh at some of these things in the past, but at the time, that was pretty cutting edge and pretty ingenious and pretty fun. I mean, a lot of those things we looked at are just, just make you feel good. So um, anyway, anybody have any questions on anything? 
What if you can throw the the ice cube maker? You you get the ice and then throw it out the window at other people. <laughs> now, Caitlin, your folks are here. <laughs> One of the quirky ones is car vacuum. Or now I'm built in a couple of fans. You know, I actually came across, I didn't do a slide of those, but I actually found a vintage one of those too that hooked up to the exhaust. And I thought, how does that work? You know, it's pushing, I don't know how it worked, but, but yeah, it was a, how, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the exhaust passing by, I'll make a vacuum on the other two. Yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I never thought about that, but I guess that would work, so. Anyway, it was fun putting this together, and there was a ton of other stuff out there, so just go in and Google it sometime, and and read up on it and go into that wrist twist steering YouTube, watch that car being driven with, that's pretty ingenious. It's just fun to see how some of this stuff was used and made automobiles fun. So thank you all. <laughs>